Well, by grace alone. A number of years ago, um, I think probably uh, sometime uh, around 10 years ago, I, uh, our church in Scotland uh, bought a new hymn book. And the real reason we bought a new hymn book, you understand that when you go to Scotland, you are not given a hymn book that's got tunes in it. You're given a hymn book that has only words in it. Um, and so, coming to live and work in the United States of America, I discovered uh, when I was about uh, 30, in my early 30s, that I was usually going up when I should have been going down. And uh, I still have something of a tendency to do that. It's usually accidental. But we bought a new hymn book for one simple reason. It was that this hymn book had uh, understandable and singable versions of the 150 psalms or psalms. And uh, one of the things I've really been committed to during my ministry is that the congregations I've served should read through or sing through, and preferably both, the entire Psalter. In fact, in our own church in Columbia, this Sunday night we come to the 150th Psalm as we've read and sung our way through the Psalter. And I'm sure at the church door on uh, Sunday night, people are going to say to me, so what do we do now that we've finished number 150? And it was in this new hymn book that uh, I first came across this hymn by an African pastor by the name of Emmanuel T. Sibomana. Uh, pastor Sibomana uh, was, I think, converted in the days of uh, what some of you may know as the Rwandan revival. There was a very remarkable movement of God among the Rwandan people, and uh, Pastor Sibomano was brought to faith in Christ, became a gospel minister. Not very much is known about him. Actually, one of the things that uh, has been suggested to me about him, I've uh, no reason to uh, regard this as deficient information, but that there was a time when he drifted away from the Lord, and in God's grace, he was restored wonderfully to a joyful walking in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we made our way through this hymn book, uh, we came to this particular hymn, uh, a, a hymn about grace. It's uh, actually printed in the, in the book. I think there may still be a version of it on the Ligonier website so that you can actually hear what it sounds like. And I became intrigued by this hymn that we just discovered as we made our way through the hymn book, How the Grace of God Amazes Me. And there were several things in particular that struck me about the hymn. The first thing, of course, was that it was yet another hymn on the grace of God. And I think I had come to feel in many ways that uh, many of us in the Christian church not least in Reformed churches where we emphasize that salvation is by grace alone, uh, that we'd actually grown rather accustomed to grace, and that many little subtle things had begun to take place in our lives. Of course, we needed the saving grace of God uh, in order to become Christians, but now that we are Christians then uh, in a kind of exponential way, we might need the grace of God less and less. Whereas one of the things that the New Testament so emphasized was that the longer you go on in the Christian life, the more you became conscious of your need for the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Another thing I suppose I'd learned just through pastoral experience was this that Christian people tend to fall off the gospel center either into what we usually call legalism or, on the other hand, antinomianism, a legalism in which we are restricted and bound, and uh, we make sure that other people will be restricted and bound with us, or an antinomianism that uh, makes us uh, 
think and say things like, free from the law or blessed condition, I can sin as I please and still have remission. I found that fairly frequently when people I was traveling with were breaking the speed limit. And uh, I might say, <clears throat> and they would say, well, I'm free from the law. The implication being that once you have found the grace of God in Jesus Christ, who has obeyed God's law for you, you can forget about obedience to God's law. And that had become a very striking thing to me because, of course, in the great promise of Jeremiah about the new covenant in Christ, the effect of the new covenant, and I'm astonished how many Christians emphasize that we're living in the new covenant, but don't take the time to read what the Scriptures say about living in the new covenant, that the effect of living in the new covenant and the power of the Holy Spirit is that what the Spirit writes into your heart is the law of God. It's a very striking statement, isn't it? And cited, of course, in the letter to the Hebrews, the kind of thing that Paul says in Romans 8, 3 and 4, as he's emphasized there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He goes on to emphasize that what the law couldn't do because it was weak through our flesh, God has done sending His Son in the likeness of the flesh of sin and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in those who believe and who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. And so, I found myself often uh, trying to uh, walk that narrow but wonderfully liberating path that the New Testament teaches us that enables us to disable legalism and preserve us from antinomianism. And as I pondered this, I began to realize, reading Paul's letter, something that seemed to me to be of primary importance, and it was this. Our tendency when we are legalists is to think we can resolve the problem by throwing in a little antinomianism. And our problem when we confront antinomians is to want to turn them into legalists, but the New Testament does neither of these two things. The striking thing that I felt the New Testament greatly emphasized, and especially the Apostle Paul, not just in Romans and Galatians, but everywhere, was that he saw that the resolution for both antinomianism in our spirits and legalism in our spirits was one and the same resolution, and it was this, the grace of God in the gospel. And you notice when he deals with antinomians in, for example, Romans chapter 6, will we continue in sin that grace may abound? His answer is not, no, you need to add obedience. His answer is, my friend, if you ask that question, it's fairly clear you have very little understanding of what the grace of God actually is. And similarly, on the other hand, as he deals with legalism in its various forms, he emphasizes that it's the grace of God in the gospel that transforms legalism into joyful, faithful obedience to Jesus Christ. And I think it was probably that in my spiritual and pastoral pilgrimage that rather led me to believe that the grace of God might not be as well and clearly understood among us as it really needs to be. And when I came across this hymn, which actually is very different from every other hymn I'd come across, uh, I thought, you know, it would be a great thing for our people if I took seven Lord's Day evenings, uh, because there were seven verses in the hymn, and picked up the theme of each of these verses and expounded it from some passage in Scripture. 
Because of that, this book does not have a kind of systematic order, nor is it, for that matter, an exposition of the hymn, but it is an exposition of the themes of the hymn. And they are as follows. First of all, that saving grace sets us free from bondage. Second, that saving grace is God's unconditional love that transforms our lives into joyful obedience. Thirdly, that God's grace comes to us through Jesus Christ. Now, just at that point, let me pause and say something that uh, I think is quite important for the thesis of this book. God is not gracious to me because Jesus Christ died for me. Let me say that again. God does not become gracious to me because Jesus Christ died for me. Jesus Christ died for me because God is gracious to me. Now, why do I say that? Because I've often heard the gospel preached in exactly that way. What Jesus Christ did on the cross made God gracious towards us. But uh, that's not the teaching of John 3.16, apart from anywhere else in the Scriptures, is it? What John 3.16 teaches is that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. And that, I would say, turning an element of the gospel on its head was uh, something that I wanted to emphasize in the course of this book for this reason, that if I believe that the heavenly Father becomes gracious to me because Christ did something that constrained Him to be gracious to me, then one of the things I've done is to place a wedge in between the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the grace of the heavenly Father. And actually, that was significant uh, in this book and uh, significant for me behind it in pastoral ministry because I had met so many Christians who had a disposition of love and faith toward the Lord Jesus, but had very little sense of the absoluteness of the grace of God the Father towards them, and a certain uncertainty, and therefore a lack of confidence and assurance, as though somehow or another the Father was hidden behind the Son, and there might just, you know, His hand might just be in a clenched fist behind His back if Jesus didn't get in the way to say, Father, don't hit them. And of course, uh, what was even more fundamental than that was that that notion that Jesus did something to constrain the Father to be gracious meant that there was an inbuilt, essential difference of disposition towards sinners between the Father and the Son, and therefore between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And our doctrine of God the Trinity and His unity of disposition towards us, that the Father lovingly, graciously planned salvation, that the Son willingly effected salvation, that the Spirit delights to apply salvation. But in a sense, as uh, we've been thinking already in this conference, the very doctrine of God was at stake in this and therefore a right understanding of the grace of God in the gospel was so very, very important to us. And of course, that's effected in the work of Jesus Christ for us, and if Christ has died for us, that guarantees our security. Again, that was simply a principle of the grace of God, the Trinity, that the Holy Spirit would not fail to accomplish that for which the Son died, and that which the Heavenly Father in His infinite and eternal glory uh, had planned for us.
and that at the end of the day, it was sinking ourselves into this grace that enabled us to withstand the subtle temptations of the evil one. Because one of the things I'd become convinced of, and I thought that I saw echoes of this in Pastor Sibo Mana, was this, that just as uh, Steve Lawson was emphasizing from Genesis 3 that the serpent was engaged not only in a denial of God's Word, but he was actually engaged in a twisting of God's character. As God put you in this marvelous garden, uh, all these magnificent trees, and as He said to you, you're not to have any of them. I sometimes pictured that like uh, a Christian who felt towards the Heavenly Father like a child who would be taken into a department store the week before Christmas and shown the toy department, and then with a kind of malicious cackle, his father would say to him, did you like all these toys, son? Well, none of them will be yours this Christmas. And I'd come to realize, actually, that was how many Christians actually felt about the father. And then as I'd read, I, I began to discover that this was uh, this was a pastoral need with which the great masters of pastoral ministry had already dealt. John Owen, uh, for whom I had a great love, was a, a primary illustration of this. And he says at one point, in, uh, I think in the second volume of his works, he says, how few there are who have a real appreciation of the Heavenly Father's gracious disposition towards them. And I found myself with uh, doubting and struggling Christians having to re-gospel them and, in a sense, to re-trinity them. And in so many ways, this uh, particular hymn gave uh, wonderful expression, not systematic expression, not even logical expression, not exegetical expression, but real expression to the nature of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. There are two particular verses and therefore two particular chapters um, that I thought at the time uh, were very important to include. The fifth verse of Pastor Sibel Manor's hymn goes like this, "'Now all my heart's desire is to abide in Him, my Savior dear. In Him to hide, my shield and buckler He, covering and protecting me, from Satan's darts I'll be safe at His side.'" That expression, Satan's darts, how does the grace of God in the gospel protect us from Satan's darts? And then in the next verse, Lord Jesus, hear my prayer, your grace impart, when evil thoughts arise through Satan's art, or oh, drive them all away, and do you from day to day keep me beneath your sway, King of my heart. And I was struck by this, particularly that last verse. Lord Jesus, hear my prayer, your grace in part, when evil thoughts arise through Satan's art. What are these evil thoughts? Well, I thought I knew what they were, both uh, by pastoral observation, by uh, reading in the works of uh, far greater pastors than myself, and from observation of the human heart, that there were, I couldn't say how many Christians but there were numbers of Christians that I found myself uh, seeking to help and encourage who came to me in a spirit of dread because, for example, they had found malicious or even blasphemous thoughts about the Lord Jesus coming into their minds. Now, it's likely that in a, in a group this size or many of us who who, if somebody said that to us, we just couldn't imagine what that would be like, and we would doubt whether this person was really a Christian. That would be a sign, among other things, that we'd never read Pilgrim's Progress, that we 
for all we love Charles Haddon Spurgeon, that we didn't know much about Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and that this was the experience, strikingly, of both John Bunyan and C. H. Spurgeon, that there, was a, there were darts of Satan and there was an art of Satan. And that art of Satan, in some mysterious way, was his ability for, in, in ways that we cannot understand, as it were, to fire those darts suddenly into the minds of believers, believers not knowing that they had come from an ambush, and therefore not able to distinguish between those injections of Satan and the thoughts and dispositions of their own hearts. And I found, as I had tried to read widely over the years of my Christian life, that uh, many of the Puritan writers had found uh, among Christians exactly the same thing, and that the response, therefore, you can't possibly be a Christian if there are thoughts like that in your mind was actually somewhat akin to Job's comforter saying, the root of the problem is in you. And the striking thing, because uh, there is a, there's a lengthy section in this book uh, on uh, the experience of Job, the striking thing about the book of Job is that some of the most magnificent theology in all the Bible is in the book of Job, in the mouths of Job's comforters, and they do disastrous things with true theology because their minds are dimmed to the reality which every reader of the book of Job understands if he opens the book or she opens the book at the first page and realizes what neither Job nor his comforters realize that all that's happening to Job that's affecting these struggles against God, he feels that God is pounding him and destroying him. And so, inevitably, he's beginning, as the older writers used to say, to think hard thoughts of God, that actually all of that was the production of the evil one, and that therefore his place of ambush needed to be thrown over and the origin of these thoughts needed to be unmasked, not as the disposition of the individual who struggled against them and hated them even while having them, but to recognize, as uh, Job does at one point in the book of Job, what actually I think is the high point in the whole book of Job before you reach the climax he cries out as he's saying to God, God, why are you doing this? I hate it. Why are you doing this to me? And then he asks this question, if it isn't him, who then is it? And if we were here as an audience watching Job as a drama being played out on this stage, and before the drama had begun, out onto the front of the stage before the curtain was drawn for us to see Job and his whole experience, we had seen those descriptions in, in Job 1 and Job 2 of the desires of Satan. At that point in the drama of Job, most of us would be standing up shouting to him, shouting at him, Job, it's not God. These dispositions you feel and you're feeling them now, beginning to feel them towards God. They're actually injected into you by Satan, and they're really fit to be directed against Satan. And, as, uh, and this has been true, I think, through most of my ministry, that there's a constant uh, little dribble of God's often dear, sensitive saints who, as Calvin says in the Institutes, find themselves almost driven to madness by despair, and they don't know where the ambush is, and they assume it's all coming from their own heart, 
and they need to learn to distinguish between the thoughts and intentions of their regenerate spirits and these malicious and at times blasphemous thoughts that have crept into their minds. And um, actually, I, I think one of the interesting things about the book is that when, when uh, on those occasions people try to encourage you by telling you they've actually enjoyed the book, it's been interesting to me that I think of all the chapters, those are the particular chapters that, that seem to have helped uh, many Christians most of all. There's one other thing uh, that I think I maybe should mention about the book. Uh, one thing I should say and one thing I should mention. Uh, the only reason I'm doing this is because of the golden rule, which says you're supposed to do to others what you would want them to do for you. And it, I just find, I find it endlessly fascinating listening to people talk about what they've done and why they've done it. So I'm constrained joyfully to do this. The other thing I want to say is this that just in the course of life um, and in the course of my study of theology, I had become somewhat convinced that even after the Reformation, uh, many Christian thinkers maintained an understanding of grace that belonged to the pre-Reformation church and not to the New Testament gospel, or to the teaching of the post-Reformation church. And what I mean by that was this, that in the pre-Reformation church, with its sacramentalism, grace was essentially a substance, and you got more or less of it. And I'd begun to feel, actually, that many Christians think and speak of grace in exactly that way. It's a substance of which you get more or less. And so, I wanted to emphasize in this book that grace is not a substance. In that sense, it's not a thing. What the New Testament speaks about is not grace as a substance of which you can get more or less, but the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, because grace isn't a substance. Grace is a person characterized by His saving work. And so, if I can put it this way, there isn't, there isn't anything between the sinner and Jesus Christ. I don't go to Jesus Christ to get grace. I go to Jesus Christ to get Jesus Christ. And as Paul says in Ephesians 1, when I get Jesus Christ, I get all grace and every spiritual blessing in Him. At least, I think that's what the book is about. It's a couple of years since I read it.